And so I'm just gonna introduce Grant Smith, who is be moderating and speaking on our first panel, what is the Israel lobby and how does it work? Grant is the director of the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy, or IRMEP, again, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. He's the author of several books on the Israel lobby and its various activities. He uh, also recently has been engaged in uh, several lawsuits with the Department of Defense and the CIA in an effort to get information on Israel's nuclear weapons program released. And with that, Grant will take the reins. Thank you, Dale. I want to start uh, with a story, and then I'll introduce our other speakers. And that is about one of those lawsuits. On February 10, the Department of Defense released a document, Critical Technology Issues in Israel, that unequivocally confirms for the first time from a US government source that Israel has an advanced nuclear weapons program and national laboratories equivalent to our Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore laboratories. And that the SORAC reactor, a gift for Adams for Peace from the Eisenhower administration, has, quote, the technology base required for nuclear weapons design and fabrication. This process was 1,132 days and another 140 days in federal court. As many of you know, and this is one reason we're repeating so many of these loops about nuclear weapons, we do have modifications to our Foreign Aid Act of 1961, the Symington and Glenn Amendments that occurred in the mid-70s, which explicitly prohibit U.S. foreign aid to countries trafficking in nuclear weapons technologies outside of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so our question must be, how much are Americans at this point owed for all of the aid that was delivered on false pretexts? This amounts to $234 billion as of today. And if there are 122 million U.S. taxpayers, our average refund per taxpayer is that figure up on the screen, $1,900.09 and 54 cents, or $9 and 54 cents. So the question is, it's a video to say, why do presidents deny that this uh, weapons program exists? Why does the press underreport it? In this game, as in many games, if you're looking at a con develop and you can't figure out who the mark is or the victim, that's because it's you. In this case, strategic ambiguity, as it's called, is a farce masquerading as grand strategy that started back during the Nixon administration. In 2014, the ISCAP, which is the highest declassification authority in the United States, overruled and released information about the nixon Meyer negotiations in which Nixon's feelings that he would be, quote, uh, have a Zionist campaign to try to undermine, unquote, him if he did not agree to this gag policy is clear at this point. Israel claims it won't be the first to introduce. Our presidents won't comment on it. Whistleblowers are punished by Department of Energy regulations. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is undermined and taxpayers are both abused and uninformed. And it's not like they don't know. The question to ask is who's being fooled? In a Google consumer survey last year, uh, a majority of Americans, almost 64%, said that they believe the Israelis have a nuclear weapons program. So they're not being fooled. And it's a testament to the power of Israel lobbying organizations in this country that a policy costing so much can last for so long. So what I'd like to talk about are one portion of activist organizations, which I call Israel affinity organizations, uh, which is a tax-exempt portion uh, of this lobbying ecosystem. And just to define that a little bit more, we're gonna look at 350 organizations, we're gonna look at when they were formed, we're gonna look at some of their major functional categories, and what could happen in the future as they continue to grow in terms of revenue and resources. So every 
organization I'm talking about in aggregate is a 501c3 or c4 organization. That's unconditional support for Israel as is a top priority. It's headquartered in the US and it's retaining its tax exempt status. Again, that's almost 350 organizations, but it's not the whole picture. In terms of the whole picture, we realize that in blue we have this darker and darker puzzle called bundling, campaign contributions premised on support for Israel. In red, we know there are captive media organizations. We know that the Brookings Saban Center is a carve out of that organization that's very pro-Israel. Not counted. Churches, synagogues, not counted. Just the green portion, uh, which is the puzzle piece that we're looking at right now. The first data extract reveals uh, in terms of the time that they were incorporated or received tax-exempt status, there are four great waves. Um, <clears throat> number one, the wave uh, asking for approval of Zionism, promotion of Zionism and immigration. Phase two, state building, the creation of fundraising organizations, the big transfer organizations and subsidy organizations came into play. The 80s and 90s are a period of the media watch and think tanks, the off-splitting of the Washington Institute from the mothership APAC. <clears throat> and the fourth wave, uh, I like to talk the attack, attack lawfare at campus monitoring and messaging are the top priorities of these organizations. And later on in the program, uh, there'll be a lot of people talking about um, Israel activity on campus. It's interesting that half of the organizations uh, surveyed, which are the biggest, were created before 1975, and half of them were created after 1975. Uh, this is interesting because it coincides with the period at which the Justice Department, after trying to get the Zionist Organization of America to register as a foreign agent seven times, after ordering the American Zionist Council to register as a foreign agent only to see the lobbying division APAC split off six weeks later and start the same activities, they threw in the towel. And so the number of organizations exploded, as did the amount of US foreign aid, the blue line, um, in terms of their lobbying successes. So there's this blossoming of foreign aid that occurs right after DOJ threw in the towel. The uh, demands of these organizations, if you review tens of thousands of Nexus, Lexus pages have evolved over time from simple recognition to the much more troublesome um, trade concessions. Of course, our first foreign trade agreement was with Israel terrorism designation of Israel's enemies, and finally calls for US military action against Israel's enemies. So these four great waves of Israel affinity organizations leave us asking, what will be the next great wave? Uh, I call the last one the imposition wave, in which we're imposed, told how to think uh, on campus, told uh, what Americans think by the Israel project and its dubious polls. Uh, told uh, what's legal and not by the law for uh, project on campus. These campaigns have been so highly successful because um, Americans are fooled. In fact, right now, uh, most Americans, according to a Google consumer survey that we took last fall, statistically significant, 58.5% think Iran already has nuclear weapons right now. So just like the run-up to the war in Iraq, where Saddam was believed to be uh, involved in 9-11, involved in possibly uh, having weapons of mass destruction. We're at that point right now in terms of Iran. And who can blame them with terrifying videos? This is a clip from the Clarion uh, video called Iranium, which shows us these menacing Iranian boats off the eastern seaboard launching nuclear Scud missiles into the United States. If I receive that, watch it and believe it, of course I think Israel, or excuse me, um, Iran has nuclear weapons. So in aggregate, the total revenue of these 350 organizations has been growing. It suffered a bump, obviously, during 2008. In 2012, it was $3.7 billion a year. The total charitable sector in the US is about $350 billion. That's growing at 4% per year. On average, Israel affinity organizations are growing at 
and that makes a big difference over the long run. At present, in aggregate, this sector of 350 organizations with Israel as a top priority uh, are right behind the United Way, the largest tax-exempt organization, and right ahead of the Red Cross. So we're talking about serious money and uh, a very cogent set of uh, different categories of activity. So I'm going to break them down into subsidy, fundraising and local political action, the advocacy organizations, and education and training, and look at their changes over time. The base of this pyramid are the organizations that collect revenue, tax exempt, send it to Israel, send it as American Friends organizations, American Friends of Technion, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and ship it overseas. The second level, fundraising and local political action, um, are the federations and JCRCs. Then we have advocacy organizations like APAC, and finally education organizations. So these subsidy organizations uh, represent about 100 organizations. Um, the largest category members are the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, and these organizations uh, are basically tasks that are very, uh, um, uh, very much active in collecting and transferring revenue. Uh, the second <clears throat> level of the pyramid is much more interesting. It's the fundraising and local political action organizations. There are 152 federations raising large amounts uh, through local fundraising campaigns. Most major fundraising organizations are federations. They give to local uh, Jewish and non-Jewish recipients, but they're also giving large amounts uh, in direct transfers to Israel, and their community relations councils are highly active politically, highly active media watchdogs, and also lobby for local city and state initiatives. The General Assembly rivals APAC, except it's a much more comfortable, high-profile gathering of pundits from the media, friendly uh, government officials, etc. Uh, they are forming more uh, interesting, robust mini APACs in each state, such as the JPAC of California, uh, which is lobbying effectively at the state level. And although they always claim on their websites that they're not uh, official sponsors of APAC events and other political events, uh, they're very uh, active in pushing that national agenda down. Uh, close up, uh, if you look at a uh, foundation in Greater Los Angeles, they paid out $50 million in grants, 6.6 .6 in transfers to Israeli organizations, another 3.8 to some of these uh, newer media watchdog, Birthright Israel, which organized trips, the Israel Project, which does research, uh, and money for lobbying to the JPAC of California. If you're not involved in this, the tax impact uh, is still clear. It creates about a $7.8 million hole that others will have to fill. And there's some interesting test cases going on here locally about getting US taxpayers to pay for what was traditionally paid for by the organization, such as a million dollars in uh, funds for building a new Hillel on campus instead of having the organization pay for it. Taxpayers are paying for it after uh, lobbying by JCRC. In terms of Media Watch, this is the kind of thing they watch out for. This single picture of a Palestinian father who was uh, grieving his dead child uh, w was organized against the ombudsman to make sure that uh, this anti-Israeli bias would not be shown on the front page. So uh, Israel Action Center media communications organizations are very active through JCRCs. Uh, the website of the federations boasts of their coverage. They claim 152 of these with the JCRC embedded and not separately reporting uh, taxes or lobbying expenses, uh, but very active in terms of lobbying. So uh, advocacy is everything else. The large organizations that claim to represent these networks, that lobby Congress, get legislation passed, um, and essentially um, work to ensure unfavorable press and buff up Israel's image. If we look at what they're fighting, 
They're not really fighting other organizations. What they're fighting is public opinion. In a fall survey, 60.7% of Americans, when being advised of the relative levels of aid to Israel, said that they did not support the current levels of aid. It was either much too much or too much. So it takes a lot of money to get increasing, in many cases, uh, annual aid to Israel in the face of massive public opinion that's passive but very clear in polling. Here's another poll. We took this last week. Representative, statistically significant, Google consumer research. Congress, here's the poll question, Congress and state legislatures passed scores of resolutions condemning Palestinians and voicing unconditional support for Israel every year. Two questions. These resolutions do not represent my views. These rep uh, resolutions represent my views. They're randomly reversed. Almost 70% uh, of Americans say, these don't represent my views. So it takes real money to pass these in state legislatures, in the uh, Congress, uh, in, f in the face of this passive but very significant opposition. So the education and uh, training and indoctrination uh, segment of Israel affinity groups and organizations is really involved in training uh, within the community, Zionist education. For the American public, it's about Holocaust museums. Uh, for law enforcement, it's about getting the ADL into law enforcement to train them uh, on counterterrorism. Uh, and so it's, a, it's an effort uh, that's collecting about $317 million in 2012 with 14 major Israel affinity organizations uh, propelling that. And so uh, most Americans, again, in, broad, uh, in broader scope, according to a 2012 Chicago Council survey, don't take one side or the other when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And so it takes real money, uh, real political power to overcome uh, what has been showing up in poll after poll after poll of the general American public. And so that's why I think uh, when you look at the growth of the education segment of Israel affinity organizations, that's been the fastest growing segment since 2001, 108% over the time period between 2001 and 2012, with subsidy organizations growing at 62%, uh, advocacy at 72 So there's this real effort to reach youngsters, uh, younger and younger, where they are, which is in social media and online, to give them the favorable views uh, that many older Americans have. And it looks like that will continue to be a priority in terms of spending uh, over uh, the future uh, toward the end of the uh, decade as well. So in terms of employment and volunteers, 14,000 people are on the payroll of organizations that have promoting unconditional support for Israel as a major goal. 353,000 volunteers. And I've listed some of the bigger ones in order, uh, but I would like to go on to what the future portends. And in this case, I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Um, Israel Affinity Group revenue is growing quickly, more quickly than overall charitable donations between 2001 and 2012, we expect that a strong economy, fundraising appeals, and the acceleration since 2008 is gonna increase that growth to 9%. And it's worth tracking for one reason. Israel aid is a domestic political issue. It has nothing to do with US national security. It has nothing to do with uh, protecting the United States. It is purely a political issue and it shows up in the numbers because Aid to Israel closely tracks the amount of spending of Israel affinity organizations. When it goes up, aid goes up. When it goes down, it goes down. It's highly cor correlated. And so I can say with confidence, uh, especially with President Obama making noises of conciliation after this initial Iran agreement, uh, that there will be more aid, secret and public, in the future. And so we see, probably toward the end of the decade, 3.5 billion in aid increasing to $7 billion a year 
if this trend of correlation between fundraising, uh, sort of a, uh, a symbol of political support, and aid continues. They're closely related. I would urge, however, every American insist on getting their $1,900 back before this happens. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about agency regulatory capture. I already mentioned the Justice Department threw in the towel. It does not enforce laws on the books about foreign agency and uh, consorting with foreign governments and bringing that in as a domestic political issue. Uh, we've had espionage investigations against APAC, the ADL, the Wiseman Institute. They were all quashed by political pressure. The U.S. Treasury Department has never pulled tax-exempt status for any reason more innocuous than failure to file. And yet, the charitable purpose of these organizations is dubious. The American Israel Education Foundation, which was granted tax-exempt status as an education organization in 89, is supposed to educate Americans about the Middle East. And it said, all research will be produced and published and made available to the general public. Well, it never has been. They don't even have a website with more than one page, and that thing was put up a year ago. Um, their observable activities are taking members of Congress on trips to Israel, a thousand of them between 2000 and 2015, and their family members, providing tax deductibility to donors for APAC education, what I would call a disinformation campaign. Uh, a secret source gave us their latest briefing book, and it's essentially a list of points which, if you read it ahead of Netanyahu's speech and his claims, you'd see that the same claims are in this briefing book to Congress, that there is really no negotiation to be done over Jerusalem, um, that because Congress recognizes this in resolutions, they're no longer subject to debate. And so it's really interesting to thumb through that thing and see that it's really not education. APAC, again, has the same sort of problem in terms of um, where it came from and when. Uh, they were incorporated in 1963, six weeks after their parent was shut down. Their tax-exempt organization uh, application in 67 was for charitable education and religious association. But they've been lobbying, just like their parent has, and have never uh, been called on the extremely tight coordination with the Israeli government. They've never been prosecuted for obtaining on three occasions classified information to lobby against American industries and pass a free trade agreement, missile secrets to overturn sales to allies, um, and they refuse to register under FARA. Even though they are a successor, the Justice Department is uninterested in that. So uh, I would just have to say um, in conclusion that studying the movements uh, of these organizations provides a real insight into the future. Um, our next two panelists will provide a level of detail that's even greater in terms of uh, their observations inside and outside of these organizations.